I've always been very intrigued by that apparent disconnection between people saying that they want to support a certain societal goal or a certain achievement and then not really acting on it. How is that possible? Until I started to think about this issue through the lenses of the dilemma structures, which showed me how, in some cases, you need to open up new alternatives which are implementable for people to really act on issues. You need to coordinate their efforts. And I do believe that if more people were to know how to use this type of thinking, we would be much better at approaching and solving a lot of the societal challenges that we are facing. Some consider the Duomo of Milan in Italy to be the most spectacular cathedral of Europe. Some do not. Oscar Wilde, in the year 1875, wrote that the cathedral would be an awful failure. Like so many European cathedrals, it took many centuries to complete the building. Construction time of the Duomo was from 1386 to 1965, almost 600 years. But unlike most of these other projects, construction of the Duomo went on almost continuously throughout that time. This presented a dilemma for the architects and artists. Should they continue to build along the completely out-of-fashion style of centuries ago, or should they build according to the styles of their contemporary times? The dilemma was solved by doing both. And thus, the cathedral integrates elements from Gothics, Baroque, Renaissance, and even Classicistic, creating the overall ensemble it is today. Silvia Castellazzi lives and works in the city of Milan, her hometown. Her research is about the value of dilemma structures. She will tell us about how a dilemma can be a source of inspiration and innovation. We'll be discussing one main question during this video. How is it possible that certain societal initiatives or things which could bring about benefit for a large number of people and which also seem to enjoy a certain consensus by the parties and the actors involved, how is it possible that these initiatives and situations then do not get implemented in practice? Is it because of a lack of knowledge on what to do, or um, is it a lack of willingness to act in that direction? Or is it because things get framed in a trade-off form and then we always lose on one of the two ends? We'll try to address this question from a rather different perspective, which will help us to identify a more implementable solution in the end. We'll do this through the structures of the social dilemmas which uh, stress in particular the aspect of coordination and cooperation within this type of initiative. Most of you probably know somebody who just started uh, working after having finished high school or university or who is not in a long-term contract but rather in a temporary working agreement. We know that many people uh, find themselves in this type of situation and we also know that they don't always get the proper learning and working conditions that other people enjoy and they would and that they would also deserve. Why, why does, is this the case? Even though we know that it would be beneficial for them, it would be beneficial for the companies to have better trained and better motivated people in their workforce and to a certain extent it would also be more beneficial for a society to have a workforce which is more employable potentially in the next year. We'll look at the question of how comes that investments in training and in employability for this type part of the workforce do not take place even though there are reasons for thinking that it should actually be done. Let's imagine the following situation. There are two companies and they are each deciding whether they want to allocate some budget for a 
skills program for their interns and for temporary workers, or whether they will not invest in this type of program. The two companies do not communicate with each other, and there is also no past history of interactions or communication between the two of them. Each company has two alternatives. They can decide to invest, or they can decide not to invest. Let's think through a first scenario where the first company takes up an investment in these people and the other company decides not to do so. What would we have as an outcome of these um, decisions? We would see that the first company has decided to invest because they think that there will be a benefit from doing so for, the, for their organization or for the people involved and also possibly for society at large. And they would take up the cost of this investment even though they don't really know whether these people will stay longer enough in their organization, whether they will decide to go to another company or whether they will just leave in the end to take up other challenges. What would happen with the other company which has decided not to invest? They would be able theoretically to take some of the people with the better skills and better competences from the first company and just take them over in their organization. This would leave us with the first company having invested in the training and having lost the return on their investment because the people have gone away. And with the second company, which although it has not invested, with the better trained and skilled people which is getting from the other company, the second company will in the end be better off than the first one. They will have all the return without having had to bear the costs for the training. A similar scenario would happen if we just invert the decisions that the two companies take. Let's see what would happen if both companies would decide to invest in this program. We would have a situation where both companies would have to take up part of the cost for this program and they would sort of invest in a pool of shared resources. We have seen that we, we never really know whether people and employees will stay in our organization. So we always have to assume that they might be going to somebody else. Irrespective of this, each company decides to invest in this program because they assume that if the other company does so too, they could somehow get part of the return from taking over the people from the other organization. So in the end of this scenario, we would have two companies which both decide to invest. We would have a better and a bigger number of people trained, irrespective of the type of organization they will in the end be in. This would assume though that each company can take with a certain um, degree of certainty that the other company will invest as well. Now what we see that usually happens in reality though is the opposite case. This is our last possible scenario where neither of the company decides to invest. Since I do not know as a company what other companies and other actors in the labor market might do, and since I know that there is a chance they will just profit from my investment without having taken up the costs, I might decide to just do not take action. This would minimize my risk, irrespective of what the other company would do. What we have just seen is that there is the potential for a greater collective benefit and for a situation which can put more people better off. This would be the situation where both companies decide to invest, which is also to a certain extent a situation where both companies decide to cooperate and take action on this issue. However, we know that the two companies can't communicate and they also don't have any opportunity to judge how the other company will react or even how they would behave. This is why the normal outcome from a situation which is framed this way is that in the end none of the company invests and also none of the company takes action, leaving us with a situation which is suboptimal toward the potential gain and the potential benefit for the collectivity would be. 
We can define dilemma structures as problems which are rooted in interactions and in the coordination of such interactions. This is why the solution of a dilemma structure always has to be brought about by a concerted action of individuals or organizations. A dilemma structure cannot be solved by only one of the people or of the organizations involved. What we need to do is to change the outcomes and the behaviors in order to achieve that potential collective gain that we saw before in the structure. And to do so, we have two main leverages. The first one are institutions and institutional arrangements. We define them broadly by indicating systems of rules, both formal and informal, which can help us to modify the behaviors and the decisions which people and organizations take. Institutions help us to steer behaviors in a different way by making certain behaviors more appealing and by sanctioning or making other behaviors less appealing. We have already in practice examples of institutions which for instance helps us to solve or to a certain extent to facilitate cooperation in the concrete example which we have seen before. You can think for instance at those platforms which help uh, companies to achieve a certain standard in the working conditions which they offer. This platform offers an incentive to companies to raise their standards, for instance, to invest in temporary workers or in the interns in their organization. What companies receive is a reputational gain or improved image by being certified through these platforms for the increased quality of their working environment. And we also see that it's not enough that only one company signs up to these type of plat platforms, but we need that more companies do so in order for the platform to become credible and to become an established institution. And this is an example of how, through this type of arrangements, we can facilitate cooperation because we both provide incentive for a better behavior and we also make sure that more companies and more organizations participate thus achieving that concerted effort and that coordination that we were addressing before. The other leverage that we have is trust. Trust helps us to overcome part of the problem we saw in the structure before. When I don't know how the other actor, the other party or the other company acts, that's also because I don't have a history or a record of interactions with them, that means I can't trust them, I don't have any signal on how they will behave, and so I don't know whether they will exploit my investment or not. Trust is a leverage in this case because it helps to facilitate different parties to come to a shared understanding. In the example we mentioned before, trust would help us, for instance, uh, in discussing if we are a company with our employees, how to move forward in the future, and so having an idea of whether these people will stay with us or will rather go to another company. And to a certain extent, as long as it's within a legal framework, trust can also help agreements among companies in order to set higher standards or to take initiatives. We just set the bar higher than what it would be without this type of coordination and this type of dialogue. You can apply the model that we have just seen to other issues and situations that you are aware of, both in your jail life or in your organization or in society at large. And when you reflect on these type of issues, you can follow the next three steps. First of all, it's important that you identify the relevant actors. Who is really involved in this situation? Who is involved in this problem? This might require you to look a bit outside the common description of the situation to understand really who is impacted in this issue, also in an indirect way. The second element is to identify what drives the behaviors and the decisions which are taken by these actors. Which means there are patterns, there are rules, there are institutions and structures which create a situation, the dilemma structure, and which are not easy to be changed. 
we need first of all to identify how they impact and how they influence the actors involved. The third step is the step which requires more creativity and innovative thinking from your side. Because the patterns and the structures which are there are not easy to be changed. They are the first reason why the dilemma structure is there in the first place. So they are not easy to be changed. We need to think a bit in a broader way to think of innovative ways to organize and coordinate decisions and behaviors in order to facilitate the cooperation and the coordination that we want to achieve in the end. If you follow these three steps, you will be able to reflect and think through similar issues on your own and identify what type of potentials are there and how the situation could be improved. With the instruments of the dilemma structures, you can think autonomously about this type of issues. And there are many examples out there. You can think about action on climate change, where many of the challenges which have been brought about by globalization with long and complex production chains and with their standards. Even tax evasion is a problem which can be framed through dilemma structures. In all these cases, it's not enough to just appeal to responsibility or to the goodwill of the actors involved. And it's also not enough to provide technological or knowledge-based solution. For all these cases, we need to coordinate actions in order to achieve that potential collective gain, which we know is possible, we just need to be organized. Thank you for staying with me and goodbye.